A few things I learned during the expedition is that it's about survival. At times, though we have a set goal, we push ourselves way harder, putting ourselves at risk. I could have given a try for the rest 800 meters, but then it was putting me at risk because there was bad weather. So somebody just told me on the mountain, "Sir, salamat pagdi pachas," which means if your head is fine, you can even wear 50 turbans. So that is the reason why you should be alive to climb the mountain. Mountain is always there. So this failure um, has been the biggest success of my life uh, for the person that I am today because it has actually made me very resilient. it has uh, made me think out of the box be unstoppable and not feel ashamed of your failures or something that you've not achieved because you at least tried oh. two years after the injury also i was not fit to run Uh, because my knee was wobbly the ligament the medial meniscus had not healed the way it was uh, forecasted to heal so after that uh, the doctor just tells me bhagya you're not fit to run and for a while i was just focused like hey i'm not still fit to run i was upset again but again that uh, failure failed bhagya in me is like hey why are you thinking what you can't do why can't you just focus on what you can do and that's when i decided to cycle across the country that's when uh, i decided not just to cycle but uh, also inspire uh, people uh, who have uh, been crippled with polio so the entire mission was to cycle across the country visit around 400 government schools which i was successful enough and i always thank my injuries because um, I won't say everyone that uh, get an injury to do something, but my injuries have always triggered me to push your limits a little higher and uh, see what you can do. At least try to do something nice. So I have more aims in life now. I want to become an Iron Man. I want to complete my Iron Man, and I don't know to swim. So that's a new challenge again. Yeah. but it was a very nice challenge um, and i'm glad that bars could actually come up uh, with such an concept because not just me i'm sure everybody who part- participate in the duathlon um, would have come across a different challenge because we always it's very easy for the mind you know that one small uh, tingling voice in your mind will keep saying okay just stop and quit just stop and quit but then there's so much of battle you're fighting within yourself like no come on keep moving keep moving you keep telling yourself to push your limits harder that like, you can do this so that battle that is a fight that we all want to win and it will only happen when we get into new different challenges I am Baiki Venki and this is the Working Athlete podcast. Here I talk to working athletes from all walks of life and experts from various sports to provide you with inspiration, training tips, time management and lifestyle advice. If this is something that interests you, please make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any future episodes. Today's guest Bhagyashree Sawant is a psychologist who is working in the field of sports with decathlon. She represented her state in school nationals for cycling and is trained in self defense with karate. She attempted to scale Mount Everest at the age of 18 years and got to within 800 meters of the summit. But failures never stopped her from pursuing anything. When a serious injury resulted in a knee surgery, she celebrated that by cutting a cake with her surgeons. and followed it up by riding into guinness book of records by riding 20000 kilometers across india once she recovered from that injury in this episode we talked about how she looks at failures and how she came back from not one but two knee surgeries to stay active and achieve what some would consider impossible We talk about her goals and triathlon aspirations as well as some tips for building mental resilience. Now let us get into my conversation with Bagishri. Right, welcome to the Working Athlete Podcast, Bagishri. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much, Venki. The pleasure is in fact mine because I've been listening to your podcasts, and uh, it's really amazing how you've been uh, actually exploring and taking every cyclist stories to everyone. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So, to get into your story, right? Before we get into that, let us start by talking about what is work for you, currently. For me, uh, when you speak of work, um, it's something that you're passionate about, 
and uh, i've been a psychologist then uh, i've had a nice uh, corporate and uh, uh, experience in even teaching the students uh, in a college as an assistant professor but now i've been working for sports i've been working in decathlon uh, because sports was more dear to me and it's sports that transformed my life uh, with all the challenges that i've had whether it's mountaineering or it's uh, cycling and i've explored almost every dimensions of sports uh, excluding swimming but uh, yeah it's something that's made me feel very lively and understand uh, and explore more virtues of life awesome yeah so uh, what do you do with decathlon then so right now i'm the partner business lead for karnataka and um, i was associated with a brand for almost 3 years and i've taken this responsibility responsibility for karnataka 6 months back awesome awesome so psychologist huh yes nice i don't read minds yeah. that's what astrologers do <laughs> we study behaviors <laughs> yes yes um y- anything uh, that uh, you know you um, put that into sports in, in uh, the uh, reading of behavior psychology right. and stuff so uh, definitely my because there there yeah. is a uh, field of sports psychology yes. as well right yeah i was just coming to that uh, so i've been a person since my childhood uh, who loves sports and education and i always maintain that beam balance right from excelling in sports as a national athlete national cyclist national rugby player international karate fighter and being to everest so um, exploring all these fields i also ensured that i do not uh, lack in terms of education so i was always a topper child in my college and uh, always the first bencher child so uh, when i in fact moved to bangalore for my masters to do my ms in psychology uh, that's when i published almost around 16 research papers uh, national at national and international conferences of which um, i almost not us yeah four to five uh, best paper awards at international and national conferences again and i al- i was also termed as a young scientist award winner for uh, best research on sports psychology so mm. i blended both my passions together and uh, now in india as we are seeing a uh, lot of athletes are also uh, understanding the importance of mental health uh, uh, especially when it affects the performance and uh, that's exactly what i've been just trying to explore all this while oh great i think at, at some point we should do an episode just for uh, the mental side of sport and Definitely. sports psychology i, I think Uh, but for now let us start by talking about your uh, your uh, you know sports background as in uh, in the sports that you have done from childhood on right um, this is really funny so i have zero history of sports in my family because generally uh, everybody's always come asking me forward saying that hey it's your mom or your dad who's been into sports i was like no none of them but uh, i very well remember my mom used to watch olympics and she always dreamed that i want my daughter also to run in olympics when she used to see those marathon runners over there and uh, s- when i was in 7th grade my mom actually randomly uh, just she got to know that there is this district inter school competitions happening she started enrolling me for all the races and uh, so i started with athletics and then um, she was like why don't you try cycling also and i remember my first bicycle race in my school days uh, i got on a hero razor back and i had all the cyclists with road bikes with me and i stood second with just uh, merely about 1 feet of distance so somehow my mom got me a avon uh, road bicycle the next division level and the same person who was first i actually defeated her with almost 1 and 1/2 km in a 4 km race wow <laughs> wow yeah so yeah. that's how it's always been and uh, my mom i mean my mom my grandmom and my one of my mentor dr sundari ganti all three these women have played a very more a lot of uh, important life uh, role in my life in fact uh, wherein my mom has uh, taught me to be shameless in fact as a child if i was in under 14 category she used to put me for open category with women for 800 meter run and any random event she used to just put me in and they used to finish two laps very quickly and i'll be the last one like a duck you know running behind with small small steps be feeling embarrassed like okay everybody's finished i'm still running and she'll be the one clapping and cheering me and um, that's where uh, she actually taught me to face humiliation so it was not just sport through my childhood but it was a lot of learning that i had um, in terms of sports and uh, how i was performing it so this was about athletics cycling then uh, for self defense my mom put me for karate classes in my uh in my school and uh, cycling after this it just nourished uh, it because it just kept scaling a level higher 
because um, from division it became state then uh, that's when i trained harder i became the state champion i went for nationals in gudgaon i stood fourth in the school nationals so cycling was then a sport of my life but of course um, mountaineering has been the game changer of my life uh, because when i was in my 8th grade i dreamt about mount everest and when i was 18 i went to climb mount everest i missed the summit by 800 meters i climbed till 8000 meters not once twice the second year i went from the chinese side i was the first indian who was allowed to climb from the chinese side because before that indians were banned and uh, because i was working with indo china friendship association uh, i got a special permit and after that all indians are permitted to climb mount everest from the chinese side now and major contribution because mountaineering is an expensive sport it costs you 30 lakh each time and coming from a middle class family it was very difficult to uh, even dream of it but then um, my grandmom sold all her gold jewelry to send me to the mountain uh, saying that she's the only child we have why she save it for her wedding when we can use it for a passion and then my mom followed my grandmother's footsteps and she did the same and after that there was an article so almost around 20 30000 odd people uh, crowd funded this entire movement right where i had contributions as low as 11 rupees 51 101 that way wow so ma- going to mount everest when you were 18 yes. okay let's not just make it a headline and gloss over it let's go a little bit deeper and uh, talk mm-hmm. about that experience right uh not every <laughs> not every 18 year old would go and yeah heck i i am 45 now i i did not even see mount everest <laughs> up close but how was that experience uh, you know of mountaineering going getting close to the summit um how how what was the experience uh, like of course uh, words cannot define it uh, i would share some images also with you but uh, it was as i said this was a game changer aspect of my life because um, a few things i learned during the expedition is that it's about survival at times though we have a set goal we push ourselves way harder putting ourselves at risk i could have given a try for the rest 800 meters but then it was putting me at risk because there was bad weather so somebody just told me on the mountain sar salamat pagdi 50 which means if your head is fine you can even wear 50 turbans so that is the reason why you should be alive to climb the mountain mountain is always there so this failure um has been the biggest success of my life uh, for the person that i am today because it has actually made me very resilient it has uh, made me think out of the box be unstoppable and not feel ashamed of your failures or something that you have not achieved because you at least tried and a lot of times we all uh, regret Um, because we have not tried in life because fear is temporary regret stays forever so that's one thing that whatever it is i'm ready to fail now and uh, that one aspect uh, changed a lot of things happened i had a couple of near death experiences where i was climbing very fast because i started the expedition a little late and to catch up with the group and because of that i got high altitude mountain sickness my o2 had dropped real low i had lost my memory at certain point and it took almost 4 hours losing me- your own memory is still fine but uh, you actually forgetting your parents name also it was uh, very disastrous for me when somebody asked me what what's your parents name and i was just like lost so that's when uh, i was a computer science student and i developed uh, more interest towards humanities uh, towards life and i took up psychology and that's been a major career shift for me and um, yeah so that was one of the learning but the experience was breathtaking uh, the beautiful mountains um, sometimes people call me stupid because when it used to snow uh, people used to go inside their tent because it's warm inside the tent but uh, i'm born and brought up in mumbai so for a girl from mumbai directly from sea level who's never seen snow in her life and there's the snowfall that i'm seeing for the first time i used to get out of my tent start playing around like a stupid girl around and uh, hit all, all those tents with making those snowballs and everything and uh, later some of them did join into play also so it was always fun and i've always um, you know dealt with things in the extraordinary way i've always been more accepting towards life uh, made be my injury after everest that happened and uh, yeah that has always made me do a lot of extraordinary things nice nice yeah uh, like you said right going that close and uh, giving up is literally in that case is choosing between life yes and death yes so uh, i'm glad you made the right decision to 
uh, I mean, that is a, the most important decision you could make as yeah. a mountaineer, I would understand, as I understand, right? Yeah, because most of them feel that summit is the ultimate goal. Summit is not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is you coming back alive. Mm. And that is what most of the mountaineers uh, today, especially the younger generation is actually missing out on that. Right. So uh, now you also mentioned that you went and attempted that from the Chinese side. Yes. What was that experience like and how far did you go with that? Chinese side, uh, the journey was totally different. Uh, on the Nepalese side, uh, we could trek till the Everest base camp. On Chinese side, they drive us from one village to another. So in terms of acclimatization, it was a little challenging. Uh, but then it was also very beautiful um, seeing the way the roads have been developed and um, the culture was totally different. Uh, we met certain Tibetans and uh, there were a lot of uh, things that were uh, uh, going around. Of course, I did not have uh, at most of the places I did not have uh, till base camp any option to choose what I want to eat because there used to be set menu which used to just be on a rotating table and you choose what you eat and I didn't like anything of it because uh, it, some of it had some meat which I never consumed. So there was one Tibetan lady and uh, she asked my Sherpa who is this girl and uh, her name was Pasang. I still have an image with her. She was around 60 years old then. And uh, they told her that this girl is from India and she was so mesmerized. She used to make dal rice for me, hide it and hide it from the liaison officers and get it for me so that I could have food. And then there was another Malaysian doctor with me who also could not eat certain meat forms. So we had a trading thing because he had this packed chicken. So I used to give him dal rice and he used to give me chicken in return. So we used to uh, be good friends and share our food along. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. And uh, how, 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 how far did you go with that? So uh, actually 8,000 was from uh, the Chinese side. From mm. the Nepalese side, it was close to 7,350-ish. Okay, okay, yes. okay. And Chinese yeah. side I missed because uh, the fixed the ropes were very uh, fixed very late that year. Mm. In fact, in 2011, if you see, um, the summiters from Chinese side were very less. Mm. Only the ones who fixed the rope and few of them who followed them uh, were able to make it. Right. And we didn't want to go with that batch because uh, I'm sure uh, you would have come across stories of traffic jam on Everest. Yeah. Where uh, So we didn't want to create that scenario. That's why we did not tag along with them because the longer you wait, your body is cooling down and right. it's very easy for you to get frostbite. And once you get, in fact, I have a, a, a one reason why I was even working in decathlon is one of my very close friends from Malaysia, he lost all his fingers due to frostbite. His hands are like this. Wow. He still climbs, but then... Um, I wanted to help people pick up the right gear and a lot of times, especially now that we have so many people from Bangalore as a break going on certain Himalayan treks and they always compromise on safety gears just because it's a one time trek we are going for. But mm. why it is important is what I want to tell them. That's why I started working in decathlon. Nice, nice. So uh, when it comes to uh, after the uh, mountaineering experiences, right? And w one of the things that you uh, said, the takeaways is that you became in interested in the humanities and yes. the, you know the mental aspects of it and stuff and changed the uh, studies from uh, computer science to masters in psychology yes. and all that, right? So during this process, um, what were what were the other sports that you were uh, pursuing? Uh, so after this, um, I was playing rugby for Bombay Gymkhana. Mm. And uh, in fact, uh, I, w I used to cycle and run. So I was a proper marathon runner before my first injury. I used to do a 10K every day and a 21 or 40-ish uh, on the weekends. And when I was while I was playing rugby with uh, my friends, I got sandwich tackled. I landed on my knee and I just heard a sound of a clot tearing. Yeah, for once I thought it is my... Uh, it was my shorts, it was my t-shirt, I was just checking around, no, nothing to it. Then I tried to just stand and I couldn't take the next step. And that's when I realized, okay, it was a ligament tear. Uh, of course, uh, at age of uh, eight, 19, again, uh, I freaked out at the very first instance. But then later, I consulted some doctors. They, Some of the doctors were really very nice in explaining me what ligament tear was because I never even had come across certain terminologies of ACL or some stuff like that. And it was a shocker for me. But then um, at one point, I just realized that what's the point of crying about it? It's not going to heal my ligament. It's not going to put it back in place. I have to live with the fact that, okay, now that I've torn my ligament and it's completely torn. So doctors also very nicely explained me that they're going to remove a part of my hamstring when with some chemicalization and uh, all of that, they're just going to reinsert it as a ligament. And it sounded fancy, of course. <laughs> so... 
all what i did was i started enjoying the phase of my injury because i started living it i started accepting my injury and in fact uh, i cut a cake on the first uh, because it was my first surgery with my surgeons like hey it's my first surgery let's cut a cake and yeah my surgeons still do remember me as one crazy patient that they had <laughs> but i never allowed my parents to stay with me in the hospital i was like it's okay there are people around and uh, most of the nurses used to always come sit with me and chit chat and most of them also even passed certain uh, remarks like you know in this hospital everybody is just worried about health but they are the only one who's still happy so we feel very lively so they used to always sit with me in fact certain pictures with my nurses is where you know they are posing like yo yo types with me and uh, stuff like that so it's been a very amazing journey and even 2 years after the uh, injury um, I mean I was mentally prepared that as an athlete my career will not be the same but I always still wanted to get back in sports. So 2 years after the injury also I was not fit to run uh, because my knee was wobbly the ligament the medial meniscus had not healed the way it was uh, forecasted to heal. So after that uh, the doctor just tells me bhagya you're not fit to run. and for a while i was just focused like hey i'm not still fit to run i was upset again but again that a uh, failure failed bhagya in me is like hey why are you thinking what you can't do why can't you just focus on what you can do and that's when i decided to cycle across the country that's when uh, i decided not just to cycle but uh, also inspire uh, people uh, who have uh, been crippled with polio so the entire mission was to cycle across the country visit around 400 government schools which i was successful enough uh, to cover which it. year was this this was in 2017 and 18 17 and 18 yes. and the injury was what, 2015. 2015 yes okay yes so um, a couple of things <laughs> that uh, strike me uh, right one is the way that you took the uh, situation the injury the ligament tear and uh, the attitude is always upbeat like cutting a cake on your first celebrating your first yes. surgery i did that for my second surgery also <laughs> <laughs> okay there is a second yes, surgery there's a part two <laughs> okay um, so and then focusing on what you can do instead of what you cannot do yes. right so you are not fit to run uh but you can cycle the doctor never said i'm fit to cycle mm. so i just didn't want to ask him <laughs> that's also <laughs> the second part right. but the whole purpose is uh, of saying this is because as humans uh, we have a tendency to be negatively biased that is anything that is negative let's say out of 100 tasks you've done 99 perfectly but that one task that you've not done perfectly you'll only be worried about that you will not appreciate somebody who's done this 99 perfectly mm. so similarly uh, my tendency also was not to be negatively biased over here i wanted to focus on what i could do what are the possibilities explore because uh, even opportunities we say that they never knock twice sometimes they don't even knock because there's no door so you have to create a door or a window by yourself and that's exactly what i did and um, with my doctor it was very straightforward i just told him hey i'm going for a bicycle ride so all what he said is all the best <laughs> nice nice so uh, you uh, wanted to ride uh, across india covering 400 kil- uh, 400 uh, schools, schools. Uh, spreading awareness for polio polio vaccination uh, literacy this was along with uh, rotary district 3190 that had initiated but uh, um, went across all the rotary clubs uh, from india supported this entire ride okay so what what was the route like and uh, how much uh, distance did you cover and what were the experiences there route was supposed to start from leh ladakh uh, but somehow we reached there our cargo did not reach there and uh, the planning was uh, very well done in fact there was uh, a person named uh, pavan uh, venkatesh who helped us with the entire planning and uh, the challenge was we didn't want to go off the dates because that was planned for a year we had in fact contacted every host that saying that hey on this date we will be here So if we change that we had to inform all the hosts for 6 months that we had already contacted. Right. So that's why Leh Ladakh when we went there uh, we couldn't start there on time so instead we flew back down and we started our we started our uh, schedule from a place called Palampur in Himachal Pradesh. Mm. 
um since we also wanted to cover more distance uh, because um we were also tried to make a public image of it so this was also a guinness world record attempt so we wanted to criss cross the entire country rather than just doing straight or just covering east to west or north to south so we started from himachal punjab chandigarh haryana delhi uttar pradesh uttarakhand bihar jharkhand west bengal assam again from assam we did bihar uttar pradesh rajasthan gujarat dadra nagar haveli daman and diu maharashtra then we cut through to andhra pradesh Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Goa. Uh, via Karnataka, Goa, and then finished in Bangalore. Yeah, it wow. took one eighty-three days. <laughs> wow! <laughs> All right. So, and what were some of the most memorable uh, instances from that experience? the very first day of the ride was the most memorable it was 2nd of october um and uh, 2nd of october is a national holiday right for yeah. all of us generally gandhi jayanti yeah more than us being happy about it being a gandhi jayanti we are happy about it being a national holiday of course yes but then uh, this one school uh, in fact when i was cycling so we couldn't we were mentally prepared that no school visits today it's 2nd of october but we heard some children singing as we were just passing through and we saw a school so we just visited the school and um, we asked the teachers like it's second october why are the children still here so what they mentioned is second of october it's birthday of father of the nation the parents of these children want these chil- uh, want the children to study and be productive rather than just sitting home and enjoying on the birthday of father of nation wow and uh, that is still getting me goosebumps uh, because that's the kind of motivation uh, uh, those children and trust me they were really young like Seven, eight years old, nine years old, and I was like, "Wow!" So the perspective we have towards second October and they had was totally different. Uh, but yeah, some of the uh, incidents uh, were uh, really amazing. Uh, in terms of food, it was uh, the best because we got to explore every culture, and uh, because we were going there for a shorter distance, uh, our hosts. were uh, very overwhelmed to uh, show case the best side of their uh, uh, location so we had the best food not best food best food but either which ways we were uh, since we were riding almost an average of 100 to 150 every day uh, we were burning close to 2000 to 4000 calories depending on the weather and the terrain on an average every day so we ensured that we do not compromise on calories of course we did not get the food that we wanted uh, we had to maintain a, a certain diet which we tried to follow religiously but then after seeing all the cultural aspects and cuisines we were like to hell with it let's just have yeah. whatever is available and enjoy yeah. we won't regret for sure uh but water consumption uh, almost 10 liters plus every day uh, what that was one of the major thing related to our diet in terms of route um, it was very beautiful very scenic uh, we went to villages we went to metro cities uh, we fa- we've been through like almost every corner of the nation we couldn't just go to north east for certain reason that time but then um, apart from that uh, meeting everyone it's been so nice uh, in fact uh, there have been cyclists joining us from in baroda people have cycled with us from one point to another and uh, so at certain times uh, best part of this entire journey was the school visits because uh, interacting with those little ones uh, you know especially when you go on your bicycles wearing those helmets and those jerseys they feel like there's an alien who's come to our school and they're so attentive listening to you at certain points uh, when we went to assam in fact um, of course language was a challenge because english or hindi was also a little difficult for them so what i had done was with some local guides before visiting the school itself had made points of what i wanted to say and the ones who knew english or hindi got it translated had written it in uh, in bengal bangla because they understand bangla and i used to read that like man lagai korba like study with your heart and stuff like that of course teachers also sometimes did add on and uh, corrected me but then those were the efforts that uh, we had also put and children were very receptive um it was so touching when one girl just comes forward saying that didi um, i am also going to play sports and also study like you and that is the best example to said as i mentioned i never compromise between sports and education i never chose between one right. i balance between both yeah. so that's the same example i was giving them because i feel sport uh, practicing a sport is very important at a younger age because um, it makes you more resilient it uh, makes you more bold it makes you more strong it helps you in uh, increasing your concentration skills and increasing your grasping power and even in terms of your physical and mental fitness uh, fitness are always uh, correlated so it helps you in all the aspects 
um i remember one of the place that we had been to um, this was uh, in west in one of the district in west bengal uh, named malda where uh, the village had actually shrunk because river ganga took a different course and their half of the village got washed out and it is still getting washed out and the only source of income there uh, was bd rolling hmm. so even children i had seen them rolling bds um i went to the school uh, this uh, it was stinking the road was very narrow i could uh, see that uh, children at certain places even adults uh, were just uh, urinating or pooing on that street so there was no hygiene at all and uh, when i went to the school the school's capacity 11 teachers uh, was uh, school's capacity was close to 3000 students there were more than 11000 wow and um, the only reason why the parents were ch- sending the children to the school is because government provides them free meals right and this was the case in most of the government schools that we went to uh, but of course stories were different in different places um, uh, the schools in gujarat were uh, especially after earthquake which were devastated uh, some of the rotary groups had taken care of them and they had to rebuild it and those in fact government schools looked like international schools Hmm. so the perspectives to every dimension uh, was changed and uh, the roads were really amazing in certain states and at certain points uh, the national highways were like bangalore roads <laughs> <laughs> but uh, at certain points the local roads were much better than um, what we had expected so terrain wise it was up and down like the way we have it in braveways the right. 10% bad road uh, criteria was always there hmm. but then um, of course uh, another aspect was uh, we planned it well uh, we started in october we finished in april because we did not want to encounter monsoon or heat and uh, luckily we did not uh, get any single day of uh, rain throughout the entire ride wow. yeah we just got a little drizzle in udaipur when there was one of the cyclone that was there and udaipur in fact was very beautiful um, uh, the prince of udaipur uh, mewad uh, lakshraj uh, singh uh, he had welcomed us and uh, then he sent us for lunch uh, amidst uh, um, amidst a lake and it was very beautiful and by the time we finished our lunch we were exiting there was a photo that we had cl- uh, they had clicked of us with him which was already printed and in a very royal way given to us so that was of course um, it was a totally different world nice. so we've seen from the lowest grassroots level till the most luxurious side of india as well in yeah, the center yeah, on the center yeah. tour and as as uh, that's i think uh, is a symbolic to the kind of diversity we have yes, right yes definitely uh, in all respects um, that is amazing so what were the kind of uh, you know you did you have a support car or something how how did the logistics play yes uh, we did have a support car uh, which was sponsored to us by jeep uh, for the tour and um, in terms by of the rotary club or uh, um, so it was by one of the rotarian who mm-hmm. uh, who was associated with jeep so a jeep compass okay. was uh, sponsored which followed us throughout for safety reasons yeah and uh, it was always it, we never asked the jeep to go and stop anywhere we always asked it to maintain at least 200 meters of distance but be trailing behind us because right. we were in a new place we didn't know the terrain um, there were a couple of instances where some bikers just came next to me and my other co-cyclist was in front it was two of us who were cycling and then uh, i just found them suspicious and they started talking on phone and when i stopped they also stopped so that's when we i mean we had a signal for our driver like when we do this it means it's a threat we did this within like just few seconds the car was right behind me and then those people got to know okay she, there is someone with her yeah. and then they just went well, So for that reason um, the rule was for the drug car that you stay in a space where Reachable we are visible space, to yeah. yeah okay so who who was the co rider uh co rider was uh, mj pawan he was a fellow rotractor okay yeah. okay excellent yes and uh, in terms of stay uh, when we said we planned and we had identified hosts uh, from rotary clubs and out of 183 days almost 180 days were sorted completely and 3 uh, days we had to just take care of our stay where we did not have any hosts but then uh, it was like for breakfast we used to cycle from one place to another meet a rotary club over there they'll arrange a school visit for us then we'll have breakfast with them again we restart we go for lunch visit the school have lunch again restart evening try to reach early evening before sunset visit a school and then have our dinner and the dinners used to go really long uh, because we it was clubbed with certain rotary meetings and um, it was fun yeah <laughs> 
Awesome, awesome. Yeah, and one major part, in fact, we uh, failed in planning is when we were going towards the east, we actually missed on the part that sun actually sets early. Mm. So that's where a little trouble we had, where we had to ride in the dark because our entire plan was just to ride in the daylight. Right, yeah. right, right. So that that is uh, that sounds like a very well planned and well executed ride. But um, you know, coming back to talking about the injury, did that uh, uh, you know have any effect on the ride? did it kind of act up anywhere or was it fine at certain times it my knee used to swell i mean there was still um, my knee was wobbly there was not uh, i didn't have good stability but then um, that's the good part of uh, my ortho um, yatiraj uh, because with him in fact it was always like any time i had an injury i used to tell him look this is the issue and i want to do this so he will not tell me don't do this he will tell me how i can do it even after taking care of it so that way i was uh, still uh, in good touch uh, with my doctors of course uh, but then uh, during the ride to be very honest uh, it only strengthened my legs and uh, luckily by god's grace whatever happened happened for good yeah because uh, typically cycling is uh, you know recommended for people who have with ACL. weaker uh, yeah. knees and stuff right that acl and stuff so that i think it became a long uh you know rehabilitation yeah, my rehabilitation was fun <laughs> correct right <laughs> filled with a lot of cultural experiences uh, while i was cycling absolutely awesome so once you were back from that trip right how did uh, the next phase go what was the second uh, injury or surgery you were talking about so um the next trip Uh, i mean after this entire trip i was fine i was teaching in college and everything and uh, it was actually an incident where i was dancing with friends and uh, the photographer just said jump and i jumped and i could hear the tear sound again and i was like not again oh, oh. <laughs> but i'm glad the second injury happened was it the same leg same the same acl snapped out oh oh yeah mm. and uh, this time it pulled off my medial meniscus real well along with my pcl so there were two thing two more damages that it made like you know when you're jumping in the well jump with two more friends <laughs> so that's how it happened but then um, it was fine um, the second surgery uh, there are a lot of challenges um, the first surgery in fact within a week i was able to bend my knee to 90 degree mm. in the second surgery it took me 4 months to bend my get my knee back to 90 degree plus uh, there was covid so i couldn't do the proper rehab it, uh, we were all we never knew that we are going to have a lockdown yeah it was so uh, start of 2020 right. then okay so couldn't plan it well and uh, so my rehab uh, went real slow my recovery went very slow i had put on a lot of weight um of course because of the injury as well as covid because due to covid everybody had put on weight so i don't know the exact root cause but i had definitely put on weight because i was not mobile mm. um i was walking very less i was not able to move much but then i'm glad the second injury happened because this time after the surgery that wobbly thing is very less now okay so my knee wobbles very less um, i mean it barely wobbles now i think uh, but then again it was time for me to come back to cycling and uh, the second surgery that i had there were more challenges and more difficulty so i was not sure whether i could even jump back to cycling this time or not mm. so i did my first k uh, when the uh, spokeswoman uh, vidya uh, the spokeswoman group vidya had posted a challenge which was the uh, spin the wheel challenge and uh, that's where i chose a challenge 100 km ride with great difficulty struggling 7 8 hours it took me to complete 100 km but then um, i was like okay 100 is done um no, and i've always i've always been very ambitious and looking uh, forward uh, at a higher uh, goal and aim in life that way so what next uh, next was uh, the rajyotsav brm that news that i came across and i enrolled and trust me before that i had tried uh, two brms or three okay two uh, which were dnf because uh, i've been a rider who loves to ride at her own pace i couldn't uh, uh, do that within the time frame or you know it used to be very very stressful for me i could never make it on time to the uh, uh, cps on time but then uh, luckily uh, this time uh, sanat and pramita the tandem couple uh, they were there and i had spoken to sanat before during especially during my guinness world record attempt we he used to talk to me get ride updates how are you and stuff like that so when i saw them this time at one point i just gave up and uh, that's when sanat and pramita crossed me and they were like hey just tag along 
and uh, i tagged along with them i still remember pramita was on fat bike sanat was on road bike and i was on an hybrid and pramita leading the way all through and uh, every time i felt like slowing down they like chalo 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 and i completed my first brave way um 2021 uh, that was just uh, 15 minutes before the cut off time okay yeah and oh, yeah. i 200, 200 brave 200 km mm-hmm. and i'm very grateful to this couple because um, if they were not there i think this all would have been a hat trick dnf uh, in uh, attempting 200 km brave but then after that uh, the very recent uh, season uh, of uh, sorry the this november uh, i enrolled for braves again did uh, it started with bangalore randiness challenge before of 25 to 25 kilometers which actually made me very strong so in fact this was the challenge that uh, made my legs much much stronger and then i was like okay i can do a 200 i did my 200 i did my 300 i did my 400 i did my 600 and this was within 50 days of the season mm. and i became a super randiner and i was just surprised like okay you know because when i used to when i when i had 200 dns and i was just wondering how can these people even do 400 and 600 i mean i'm sure they are using some car or motorbike like that <laughs> but then after doing it as like it's possible and people call us crazy but uh, i'm glad that the second injury actually made me a randonneur of course i still need to be 100% self reliant in fixing my bikes and all but it's a process it's just um, let's say i'm new into this field and i always thank my injuries because um, i won't say everyone that uh, get an injury to do something but my injuries have always triggered me to push your limits a little higher and uh, see what you can do at least try to do something nice so i have more aims in life now i want to become an iron man i want to complete my iron man and i don't know to swim so that's a new challenge again but yeah life is filled with challenges and roller coaster all the time so awesome, let's go yeah. for it awesome so i um Uh, i remember uh, i think the first time i saw you was uh, uh, when you got on the podium uh, was it uh, on the what uh, what you what bar you bar do atlan yes right yes. so you i um, you were there uh, doing the do atlan individual do atlan individual do atlan uh, yes and you uh, won that uh, by 11 women's seconds by by 11 seconds yes. in the individual women <laughs> yes. category uh, so uh, with this with these injuries um, so you mm-hmm. are i see that you are back to running again and also cycling and running together and you uh, just mentioned that you have uh, triathlon goals of uh, finishing ironman yeah. so how how um, how was it getting back to running and you know cycling and running together and stuff so cycling i told you the story it was how i started uh, with spokeswoman challenge then braves then my friends helping me out uh with uh, running um, in fact coming even to the cycling part it was re- really very challenging for me uh to manage between my work and the braves because especially that time i was working on the retail side mm. and retail side getting a leave on weekends was very challenging because those are the business days right so um, but still i could manage that retail uh, side uh, with decathlon with decathlon okay. yes yeah. and after that i had a career change where mm. i moved to the back end mm. but um, in that entire process uh, in fact my partner really helped me a lot uh, anything that was related to bike uh, like hey i have a brave tomorrow so my bike used to be just ready like okay fine come back from your work sleep tomorrow morning you can just go and milad that way has been very helpful um, he's not been a cyclist himself uh, but after seeing me cycle after meeting all my cycling buddies he has started cycling now and he's gone back to his country and he's cycling there and sending us images like hey look i'm cycling here so that way it's not just been a journey of me cycling uh, also people around me motivating them uh, to take up a sport or to at least cycle uh, the reason why i push cy- uh, cycling more towards people is uh, because i realize that it has very less impact on the knees mm. and with all the lifestyles that uh, we all have been having right now it is um, very challenging for anybody to just get up and run right because anybody who does that the very next few days they will have some knee pain joint pain or some some yeah. ligament issues it's very easy yeah. to get injured uh, because yes. it is it is an impact sport right. and uh, unless you build very 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 gradually you uh, you it is very easy to do too much too soon with running right um, although there is that danger in cycling it's not as uh, you know dangerous as right the impact in running yeah. is much more right. so that's why i had stayed away from running 
but what happened is um, there was um, one customer who had come to Decathlon who was from the defense sector who had had an injury and um, that's when I I was just telling my story and I told them hey let's just fight this injury together because I was not still fit to run and that concerned person was not fit to run as well and we realized we stayed pretty much nearby so the next morning onwards we started catching up every day for a short run or a jog and minimum we started was directly 5 km and that had been a benchmark so we used to run 5 km every day and with both of us who had an injury we started slow we did not really rush into like you know completing it in 25 minutes or anything like that mm. we started it slowly and uh, because of this friendship that we had this bond that we developed where no matter what we, i see you tomorrow morning here at 5 again we start running then we go back to our jobs that one month in fact conditioned me to run mm. i had become much lighter and that's like, exactly where i had my body had started shedding weight mm. because uh, now i'm 56 earlier when i went to everest and came back i was 36 <laughs> <laughs> wow. i i was 52 that time but right. then on mountain even sitting at a place you can burn your calories and right. uh, lose weight yeah. so after coming back uh, from mountain i again gained weight uh, but that was still a good enough for 42 to 45 kgs then i became uh, 56 now but before that i was uh, 62 again because of injury so i've right. been that transition of uh, i've been through all the transitional phases of weight that mm-hmm. way but because of running i became much lighter i started feeling more active and uh, to be honest uh, the frequency that i'm running right now or practicing my runs is hardly once a month mm. but even then because of that one month of phase where i maintained running as a continuing uh, practice my pace has been the same today whether i practice or not i can still run at the same pace mm-hmm. so that has been one uh, good heads up uh, but i i could say that maybe cycling compensated uh, because of the lower body strength that i got due to cycling uh, my running has been much easier so it's just that one sport has compensated to the betterment of other sport that way okay okay so uh, when you took part in that uh, duathlon uh, was it around that time that you were running uh Uh, a month before that okay yes. okay so it was uh, well timed i guess for yeah, that yeah <laughs> put it that way <laughs> okay okay and that duathlon also was really amazing because um, i practically i was really not there for winning or something but i wanted to fight that battle between myself that the transition between running you know cycling running and that's that's something that i wanted to try because i wanted to see whether my body is adapted to this or not but of course cycling i in fact i feel that uh, i was the slowest but then i could cover up everything in running mm. so it just as i said one sport just compensated to other yeah. but it was a very nice challenge um, and i'm glad that bars could actually come up uh, with such an concept because not just me i'm sure everybody who part- participate in the duathlon um, would have come across a different challenge because we always it's very easy for the mind you know that one small uh, tingling voice in your mind will keep saying okay just stop and quit just stop and quit but then there's so much of battle you're fighting within yourself like no come on keep moving keep moving you keep telling yourself to push your limits harder like you can do this so that battle that is a fight that we all want to win and it will only happen when we get into new different challenges yeah, absolutely and that uh, like you said that bar duathlon that uh, we conducted last year in november was for uh, raising funds for uh, the giving back right. program that arvind bateja dr arvind bateja is doing Uh, where we uh, he subsidizes uh, uh, back surgeries for people who cannot uh, afford uh, that mm-hmm. uh, those surgeries and uh, we are uh, going to have uh, another duathlon in may may 22nd is the date i think nice. that we announced so you have a time to I get mean, get yes, back in shape by uh, in running again. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that is that so um this is uh, this has been a fantastic uh, chat so to kind of uh, you know add on wh- what are some of the tips that you would give uh, working athletes to do well at sport and uh, you know work uh for working athletes um we all okay the, some of the basic tips uh, because uh, at once i was also in a stage where i was working 16 hours a day uh, when it came to my professional life uh, but then because i was determined that i have to practice a sport i was able to do it so we are as humans we are very good in giving reasons hey you know what uh, i have this i have worked a lot today with this and that uh, but then uh, that's how we just give reasons and escape from our workouts or from our sport but then um, instead 
बी डेडिकेटेड इन जस्ट प्लानिंग योर स्पोर्ट फर्स्ट एंड प्लान योर वर्क अकॉर्डिंगली बिकॉज वंस यू जस्ट प्लान इट थिंग्स विल ऑटोमेटिकली फॉल इन प्लेस ऑफकोर्स आई एम नॉट सिंग इट विल बी ईजी इट मे बी चैलेंजिंग बट इवेंचुअली वी हैव टू मास्टर द आर्ट ऑफ मैनेजमेंट बिकॉज इट्स द नीड ऑफ द आर एंड नेवर स्टॉप और नेवर स्टॉप ड्रीमिंग बिकॉज when i say dreaming it's not about you sleeping and dreaming but your goals your ambitions in life because whatever you have decided just try for it and um, just remember that when tingling voice in your head should say even when you or your body feels like giving up should tell you that hey bhagya or whoever you are just get up and start get going because it's time that you need to prove that you can do this mm. so um, please practice self talk very much important because uh, for me it was only the self talk it was only my mental strength that uh, helped me get through it was only my mental strength that uh, made me accept things and accept failures and accept injuries so whenever you fail don't get disheartened take it as an experience see how you can make it better learn from it and uh, give your best shot because uh, whatever we do in life whether we accept or not there are a lot of people who look upon at us uh, there are a lot of sacrifices whether it's your wife it's your husband it's your partner whether it's your parents a lot of sacrifices whether it's in terms of sleep or your children um so let all those efforts count and that can only count when we are happy i won't say it's uh, equivalent to winning it's it's that you have to go and represent olympics and win a medal but whatever you're doing do it for yourself and if you're not doing it for yourself then you're not doing it for anybody awesome awesome since you mentioned about uh, the mental uh, uh, side of things and the importance of self talk uh, let us spend a little bit of time sure. on that aspect right so what are some of the things that you would um, you know suggest people to try in to uh, improve their mental resilience you know right. uh, it can be a hard workout that they are really afraid of it can be a very hard challenge um, uh, that uh, a race that they are really um, uh, afraid of to take part in it can be that 600 brevet that they are, you know they are scared of and anything so how do they uh, all of these things would be possible if you are if you are mentally resilient right so what are the things that they can do to gain that right um so speaking of self talk um, first i would like to state a very uh, classic example there was olympic final between carolina marine and pv sindhu for badminton and if you actually see that final um, every time carolina marine lost a point she was not disheartened she just kept telling herself it's okay let's do it let's do it she kept pumping herself with the self talk just to give an example again um let's say there is a race a child is running during the race the child falls but there is his mother from outside who is screaming come on get up and run and listening to that he will get up he will start running had that voice not come before or maybe the child would have not even got back and he wouldn't he would have just quit over there or been crying so what happens most of the time is when somebody motivates us we feel very motivated we call it as extrinsic motivation but how about this voice rather than coming it extrinsically coming from within you how if it is intrinsic you don't need to rely on anybody else to motivate you if it is there within you itself you keep uh, pumping yourself with lot of uh, affirmations with a lot of positive talks it's going to definitely align your subconscious mind automatically to do it for example um, now if i say hey i cannot do mathematics i mean i'm going to definitely fail in the subject it's so tough instead of just saying this how about you saying hey mathematics is more challenging and i want to clear it so i'm going to put more efforts so never even don't even use any negative sentence like i uh, let's say i want to i want to cycle 600 km okay so without failure so rather than saying i want to cycle 600 km uh, without uh, getting cramps or like that you're still giving a negative image of cramps instead mm. i want to cycle 600 km in the most healthy way so mm. always have those positive sentences and affirmations done in such a way that it actually helps you align your goals and trust me our subconscious mind is just a baby mm. whatever we tell the, our mind that's exactly what it's going to follow so if we implant uh, doubts over there it is going to just get confused and don't know what what it has to be done right very uh, when you in fact mention about 600 for that matter i i practiced a lot of visualization 
um i used to just um, because i'm also clinical hypnotherapist so i used to go in that level ones of level ones of trans uh, level one of trans and i used to just lie down i used to visualize how the ride would be and so what happens is uh, especially when you mention about workouts of course in india we have brilliant athletes who have uh, trained much harder but what happens is when it's the match day or performance day or race day that's when the performance anxiety starts triggering in and that's when whatever you have trained for you are not able to perform at the most optimum level so that is the reason why once we start visualizing it do you drive a car do you drive a car ah uh, yeah i do okay so now just close your eyes and uh, imagine your five fingers and you're just gripping it around the steering wheel hmm you just imagine no need to do it also hmm. and you're feeling the texture of it as you just switch on the engine you hear the sound of the engine you are able to smell the little smoke that probably is give going uh, giving out and you are able to see some roads or cars in front of you as you are driving so now just open your eyes without even those aspects being there you were actually you were able to live that situation right so now when you actually go and do it you already done it yeah so fear is only for the first time that we have like let's say it's one tough segment or one tough climb if it's i would take nandi climb because i did that today but uh, you've gone for a nandi climb for the first time you'll find it difficult the second time little much more easier the third time much more easier because as you get acquainted to it you are going to be much more comfortable about it right and that's exactly what visualization does you start visualizing if you're a batsman if you're playing cricket you start visualizing that okay i'm taking good shots i'm able to probably have a clear straight drive and you, so it's much easier for you so when you go on the field all of a sudden seeing the crowd you're not lost why mm. because you visualize this crowd being around you visualize the crowd cheering you so it's just creating a situation in your brain and telling your baby subconscious mind that hey it may be like this so let's be prepared for it awesome awesome i yeah that that makes a lot of sense the visualization is something that a lot of athletes at the top uh, use yes. to kind of uh, uh, not only reduce the pre game jitters but also to get them into the zone and focus right. get into the focus mode and uh, they they say right the flow state and stuff like that i guess awesome this has been a fantastic chat uh, bhagya and uh, thank you for taking the time and sharing the journey with the working athlete podcast my pleasure uh, one last thing i would like to just end this with if uh, i could cycle across the country covering almost 20000 kilometers making it a guinness record with a broken leg and uh, most of us being much more sound than me <laughs> the battles that i've been having i'm sure there's nothing that stops us so let's just get the best side of uh, best side of us out now let let's unleash that beast and uh, let's prove the world that hey i am capable of doing what i dreamt let's awesome. do that yes <laughs> let us do that yes. that was my conversation with bhagya i hope you enjoyed that if you are enjoying these podcasts and are finding them useful please consider supporting the channel by subscribing to it it really helps thanks again for your continuous support see you next week with another guest